thanks for joining me. My name is Evan Radisic. Uh, I am the managing director of the Cloud Software Association. For those of you that don't know me, um, we've got Mark here from Partneromics uh, for a part two um, of a very engaging session. We, we started off uh, last week with how to kind of um, tweak your uh, partner team's operations as, a, as an executive. And this week we're doing um, how to take strategy to actual execution uh, when onboarding a new partner, working with new partners. So I'm not gonna take out too much of your time. I'm gonna hand it over to Mark so, uh, to kind of set the stage for us. Um, and if you have any questions, wanna make this as interactive as possible. So it's can be a little bit awkward on Zoom to get in there, but we all know that. So just knowing that, just get in there, ask your questions and we'll try to, to answer those as we go. So Mark, uh, I'll uh, let you uh, take it from here. Sounds good. Thanks, Evan. Um, I'm going to share my screen. If that is okay. Let's see if I can get my little. There we go. All right. So, as we did uh, last Tuesday, um, I've invited my sidekick Greg Unruh to to join me as well. So what I'm going to go through today, so yeah, so what we went through last week is really a partner operating system, right? This SPLM, Strategic Partner Leadership Model. And that is, it's an operating model of how we can operationalize the, the partnering function at our team. And it's also a methodology or framework of how we operationalize partnerships after we sign the dotted line. And so at Partneronomics, our methodology, we believe there's really two core processes for partnering. One of those is a partnering operating system and the other core process is what we call the five phase partnering process. So this is how we go from idea all the way down to assigned executed agreements that we're ready to operationalize. Okay, so just like last week, please, if you have questions, uh, thoughts, comments, insights that you wanna share, stop and start screaming and then i will stop and <laughs> we'll hear what you got to say all right so don't don't be bashful don't be afraid to jump in okay so uh five-phase partnering process and so I, I threw in a little quote here that that i like to use and that is even the th the second or third string quarterback uses the same playbook as the starter you know so many times in business we're doing this partnering thing not only do we not have a playbook, but each individual person that's on our team doing this partnering thing, they're kind of doing it their own way based upon their own experiences. And to the extent that they have some, some tools, some methodologies, they're kind of doing it their way. They're not doing it the company's way. And so one of the first things that, that we try to instill or we try to push organizations to do is create processes, identify those processes, get them written down, and then have people follow them. And then have this continual process improvement cycle that we go through at our company. And in that way, over the course of years, we'll truly become exceptional at doing this partnering thing. All right, so the five-phase partnering process starts off with a strategy, right? And so um, our methodology says that you start off with this internal document, and for us, literally, we call it the SPP, the Strategic Partnering Plan. It's a 12-component document, and the, the sole intent is to get everybody on the same page internally, right? So how many times either you as the CEO or you as the partnering lead, how many times do we head down the path, we're doing this, this partnering thing, and we get one month, three months, six months down the road. And then we have this conversation of, hey, well, why are you doing that? Why are, why are you taking this approach? Well, I thought that our objectives were to, to get six new partners and we were going to have these sorts of deal terms and we were going after these types of companies. How many times have we done that? We've all done it. And so what we need to do right out of the gate is to have this internal document so that everyone is on the same page. Okay, so that hits number two, which is achieve internal alignment. And uh, these very specific plans, what do they do? They provide the, the what, how, when, and then how do we define success? What does success look like given those gates? We talk about budgets. A lot of times it, it, it can take more time, more money, more resources to stand up or to execute these partnering initiatives than, than maybe what we realize. 
Number two, the timelines, very critically important. There's a lot of different pieces of the business that are working together as we're executing this partnering, uh, this is partnering initiative. And then number three, it just lays out all the expectations and to get alignment on the expectations from the beginning. Super critical. And I can honestly tell you that 90% of companies, we work with hundreds across the world, 90% of them do not do phase one, the partnering strategy well. Uh, let me stop there. Just like last week, I'm going to stop uh, at the end of each one of these segments and just give folks a, an opportunity to, to make some comments, ask questions, make some statements, whatever the case is. Um, does anybody have any color that they want to put on uh, phase one, the partnering strategy? Hey, this is Jason. I think it, yeah, I think it's a, a highly important actually to, to get this right, um, especially if you're um, working with the executives on how this is going to impact the, the rest of the business. And, um, you know, my interest actually in today is um, comes from a kind of a new thing that, that I'm being tasked with, and that's combining a few, uh, 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 three partner programs kind of together and um, vastly different in approach. Uh, and, and, and what is that best kind of framework to put it together? So um, that, just to, to note there, that's, that's kind of what I'm interested in um, today as well. Awesome. Well, Jason, let me throw something out there that a recommendation that I'll make. Um, so even though, you know, we're consolidating our partnering functions or teams, whatever that may be, um, I would like to recommend as far as a strategic partnering plan is concerned, um, I would keep those very specific and, and keep those individual, if that makes sense. Um, at least the, the framework that we have for laying out this, well, so let's say one of our partnership types is a channel partnership type, right? That's let's say for our purposes, it's all around sales. And then we also have another sales in it, or excuse me, also have another partnering initiative that's all about technology and technology integration and technology enablement. Those are two very different things. Right. And so, okay. And so like from, from, a, from a partnering plan perspective, let's keep those separate so they're crystal clear and, and very pure. 100%. I'm, yep. I'm with you 100%. Sorry, I, I should have uh, um, putting together um, a partner plan from multiple companies and, and bringing it together under one thing. Uh, so implementation partners across all, all these will, will come together under one thing. Technology partnerships, strategic alliances all, will all come together under one thing. So, Awesome. And I threw a little note up here and I'm going to try to continue to push us uh, down the road so we get through all the content, but don't let me push us too fast. If you have something you want to throw out, please do that. But one little thing that I throw out here is, you know, you don't know what you don't know, right? So we've all heard that before. And I think as business leaders, step one is let's at least know what we don't know. Let, let's at least understand what questions we need to ask. We'll eventually find the answers, but step one is understanding what do we need to know. And that's one of the things that we try to uncover is to at least to, to understand what are the questions that we need to ask? What are the landmines that people frequently hit? So we at least know to probe for the landmines so that, uh, so that we don't hit them. Mark, I'll add yep. a, a quick brief comment on that just because I think it's, uh, it's important. That, I mean, it's so important on that initial kind of partner strategy and defining that. But what I find working with a lot of executives, whether it's bringing on a new partner strategy or trying to amplify or improve an existing partner ecosystem or, or strategy, um, very, very important because what you find and why this document is so important and, and particularly if the executive side of it is you are touching cross departments in many, many different areas, whether it be sales, engineering, marketing, all the different areas. And so to have this document as a, as a frame of reference that you can refer back to and continually you know, communicate that down to those other departments because you will inevitably have interaction with those departmental areas that they need to have that, that same level of visibility and alignment, which uh, is your number two item on there. 
uh, so critically important in the engagements I've been involved in. Um, but just want to pass that along. Yeah, I hate to say it this way, but I'm going to say it uh, just to hopefully save you a headache. This is a CYA document. <laughs> um, your, your strategic partnering plan, yes, it's going to provide value for you and your team to make sure that you guys are on the same page, but the real value, all of our senior executives, super busy, have 10,000 things going on. This will be your document to, that you could refer back to if and when needed, weeks, months, quarters down the road, and say, this is what we agreed that we were executing against. And uh, so the, the more specifics in there that you can put, the better. But at a minimum, put, put this framework, put some words in place to memorialize really what the intentions were, right? The what, how, the when, how we define success as gonna, best that you can. You're going to have departmental leaders that maybe have a, a high level awareness that this is an initiative or strategy, but I'll use like engineering and development, for example. As you get into some of the more tactical execution uh, areas of the, you know, standing up a, a partnership program, uh, regardless of what type of format that is, Inevitably, you're going to require some of those resources. And what I have found, you know, when I work with those organizations is you now begin to compete for resources because there's not an alignment of this is a, a, a key strategic priority for the company. And so to reinforce that, make sure that message gets communicated across to all those departmental leaders that may be involved in this process. They, they are going to touch this at some point or another. And so to, to have this document, and, and it, in many cases, you can... You can bake this out of the out of the beginning, but there is some, as we talked about on the last call, uh, it can be somewhat of a living document because there are things that will will be changed and modified through that process. But it is that point of reference that yeah, so critical to have as you uh, you know go down that journey for the next twelve to eighteen months. Yeah, to Greg's point, the more strategic, the more innovative, the more new that uh, this partnering initiative might be for your company, the more changes, shifts, and the more living <laughs> that your document is going to be. If you're kind of turning the crank and just uh, continuing status as quo and just kind of continuing to push that down, then, you know, there won't be as many changes. But if you're really, if you're truly executing a strategic partnership initiative, um, this, this will, there will definitely be changes and shifts uh, down the road. All right, so let me step into the second piece here. This is what we call engage, engage partner candidates. And so um, I've got my, my people in the way. Um, find the unique value that you can provide, right? So as we are reaching out to our potential partners, we call them partner candidates, but as you reach out to your potential partners, you're figuring out you know, who's, who's a good fit here. The more transactional and the more we call kind of the commodities based partnerships that we have. If the only thing that you can do is what everybody else can do, then by definition, you're probably not going to be quote unquote strategic for your partner. But I, I like to challenge people to think about what is it that you can provide? What is it that your company can provide that is unique and that is a value add for potential partners? Because the more unique that you are, the more power that you have, the more that they would need you. So I'm going to challenge you as you think about, you know, different companies that could be great for you. What can you do? What can you provide that's unique that would make you great for them as well? Uh, so some of the, the key pieces here is, you know, find those high valued candidates, right? So what can we do for them? What can they do for us that is unique? Um, this gives us an opportunity of how we would position our value propositions, right, to those different uh, folks. Um, number three, understand their strategy. So many times whenever we're looking at evaluating different partner candidates, we're trying to figure out what they can provide that we need. We got to make sure that, that we also flip the script and that we are, uh, we understand that we're obligated to provide value to them. And the partnerships that have the highest probability of long-term success 
are the ones where you understand their strategy, you understand the path they're going to be on, and you see how your company naturally aligns with that same path. That is where you, you're going to have what we call natural alignment. That's where you're going to have the highest probabilities of long-term success. And then number four here is um, what we call the scoring tool or the rating tool. And uh, this is just, it's literally an Excel spreadsheet uh, that we provide that, and this is what all kind of a success practice, a pro tip here, if you will, as you're evaluating partner candidates, maybe you only need one partner, or maybe you only need three or four, but you have 10 that are viable candidates. We need to have some way to objectively, quantitatively score them and score them against the various elements that are important to us. And then this is a way for us to objectively score them and we can decide which companies that we want to push further and deeper into with, with negotiations. Um, rather than making it be uh, political or just a gut feel or which person that we like talking to, talking to the talking to the most on the phone, really what is an objective score that we can put on these candidates so that we're really going down the, the road with the folks that are going to do the most for our company. Yeah, right. I push that uh, uh, like an ICP. We have a, a standard customer profile we go after. Um, this is my IPP, right? The, the integrated partner profile that we treated just like we do for um, uh, our customers. So, so the IPP actually matches to the, to their customers match to what our primary customers look like too, right? Yeah, love that. Mark, would you, uh, what would be a suggestion on, on, on being transparent on, on those actual score scorecards, you know, with the partners being, this is how we score, or would you keep that? Like, can you comment on, on the benefits or downfalls of being transparent with the scoring? Yeah, so um, I, I believe in being very transparent. Um, at the end of the day, Whatever it is that we need, whatever it is that we want out of this particular partner, we need to make sure we have those conversations, have those open conversations with the partners and give them the opportunity to position themselves in the best light that they have. Um, I would make sure that as you're doing the scoring, make the scoring be an independent exercise. Again, don't make that political or who took us to the coolest steakhouse or all that sort of stuff really make sure that that's an independent process. But the criteria, those 5, 10, 15, 20 things that we're scoring them on, absolutely. I mean, just like a job interview, right? Give them the best opportunity to show you their, their capabilities, their assets, their knowledge, what they can do for us. Make that a very transparent, very open process. Cool. Great question. Mark, I'll just add to that. One of the things that, uh, that I've done quite successfully in many of my engagements is deploy a, uh, it's really kind of an online version of a partner profile form. And that is where, uh, you know, whether it's an inbound uh, inquiry uh, looking for partnership or an outbound, once that engagement starts, I have them go through that process of completing that. And it's just kind of a Think of it almost like your desk profile for, for your partnership. Is this a good partner? Does it check all those things? And it kind of drives that scoring uh, component to it where you can rank each one of those and decide, you know, what type of partner are they? What, where do they fit in our ecosystem or do they? Uh, but it's, a, it's kind of a weeding out or a vetting tool for me as well um, that I, uh, I kind of lean into. Uh, to do that. And then there's a whole other scoring component uh, when we talk about that in a different context uh, after you have the, you know, after you've agreed and, and you have a partnership, well, you got to score and measure that partnership, which I know you're getting to. Yep. Um, I'm trying to remember. So the, the tool that we have, it has what we call 10 standard criteria. I'm yeah. trying to remember off the top of my head what they are, but it's, um, you know, financial viability, years in service or, you know, years as, as a company. Um, the reach, whether it's national or global, wherever the case is, but we have 10 standard criteria. And then you can add as many, uh, we'll call custom criteria as you want yeah. 
but have an opportunity to make that your own. But yeah, different deals, different partnerships, different opportunities, they will, they will have unique characteristics that we'll want to score them on. But yeah, Evan, we absolutely want to want to let them know what the criteria are that we are scoring so they can, you know, position themselves so they can sell themselves as to why they why we should select them. Yeah, I'll just add one more comment on that. I, I actually use that tool as well, because there's times when I've sent that and and intentionally it can be, you know, it may seem a little laborious to go through and answer those questions. And my philosophy on that is if a partner isn't willing to invest time on the front end to go through and show that information, then I don't know that they're going to invest time on the back end if they were to move forward in a partnership. Uh, so it's kind of, it is kind of that weeding out tool for me personally. Uh, I want them to be invested and, and committed to, uh, to that very initial exercise of completing that, uh, that profile so we can understand if we are a good fit and, and it makes sense to move forward. Hundred percent agree with that because once you know if you get especially if you get a lot of partner inquiries, that's really a good way to direct people uh, to um, filling that questionnaire. So it may make it a bit impersonal, but if they don't do that first step after that, like you, you you may not move forward. Yeah, that's a great point. And some of these pieces will also be a way that that we could subjectively score them. So let's say ease of communications or their, uh, their reputation as being partner friendly in the market. Some of these ways we're going to need to score them. And so from a process perspective, it, it kind of ensures that we put these companies through a certain due diligence process and to make sure that, that we don't miss some of those components. Okay, let me travel on to number three. So phase three is to negotiate or to bargain to put that agreement in place. And what I throw uh, up here at the top is always negotiate from the same side of the table, right? And this is just kind of my philosophy. So many times whenever we think about putting these partnering deals together, you know, it's, it's the dark room and it's the lamp that's swinging across, you know, and <laughs> I just don't believe in that philosophy whenever it comes to negotiating. You know, I believe in being very transparent, Here's what we're looking for. Here's the, there's the value we could provide to you. Now it's me and you versus uh, this market opportunity. It's not me versus you trying to do the zero sum game of, of kind of having this race to the bottom, but it's me and you versus this market opportunity where we're trying to create this, you know, this, this competitive advantage or trying to, to really create some, some significant value for our companies. So that's the approach. And the first thing that I put up here is the, the term sheet. And a term sheet is such a powerful, powerful way to go through this process. You know, one of the fastest ways to kill a deal is to throw a contract over at somebody after the first conversation. And so there is an entire art, in my humble opinion, there's an entire art form as to how, frankly, what a term sheet is the the different levels that a term sheet can take on and then how we go from version one to kind of version five let's call it in this term sheet process but just uh, kind of in a nutshell essentially what the term sheet should do is it should um, in a very kind of open honest candid non-threatening manner it should start to share those terms those t's and c's of our agreement and you should have your deal basically baked by the time you get to the end of the term sheet before you ever introduce a contract into the conversation. Literally, the term sheet should be used to turn around and dump into a contract. And then when the first version of the contract comes out, there really shouldn't be any surprises. And a lot of deals are killed here because people don't um, handle this this process, this critically important process well. Um, I'm going to spin through these real quick, just to kind of toss this out there, and then let's let's hit, this is a critical piece, let's let's spend a little time here. Uh, number three, the, the three hats to wear. This is a, another pretty, pretty neat thing to think about. So as we negotiate deals, and I imagine most of us, we negotiate these deals by ourselves. It's not like we have a team of people, it's us kind of doing this thing. 
Well, we share this concept of wearing three hats. Number one is the leader. So the leader kind of has his or her agenda and they're just driving through to make sure that we're making progress, we're having all the conversations, we're, we're broaching all these topics and subjects that we need to discuss. Number two is the summarizer. So the role of the summarizer is as you have these different conversations, anytime there's new or critical information that's passed, you kind of need to hit timeout mentally and summarize what that point is that was made and make sure you write it down, right? And that's the role of the summarizer. And then um, the third piece is the observer. So imagine being a fly on the wall and just purely observing the, the, the nonverbals that are taking place as you go through this uh, negotiation or this you know, certain communication exchange. It, it's almost kind of like the, you know, the, the high uh, EQ, right? The high emotional intelligence person. You know, they just kind of have this sixth sense of, is this person agreeing to, or are they kind of in flow with, with what I'm sharing with them? Or does it seem like they're just, they're just at a different place. There's something underneath the hood that I need to dig into to understand. And that observer role, that third hat is the one that, that's looking at those nonverbal cues. Okay, number three, the multiplier effect. This is obviously, this is what we're all after, right? You can either take that zero sum uh, approach or you can take that, that multiplier approach or that scarcity mentality, or you can go for the abundance mentality. But uh, I encourage you guys as you jump into these different, you know, the bargaining activities, these negotiating activities to really look for those additional pieces where you can add, uh, you know, put some more value on the table to your partner and further incentivize them to work on your behalf. And then last, but certainly not least, is the 28 terms to know. So I imagine all of us have negotiated tons of these different partnering deals, but it's amazing how topics like exclusivity, for example, you know, I mean, still to this day, I see pieces that are written, white papers that are written by quote unquote partnering professionals, professionals that say, you know, never agree to exclusivity. That's, that's one of the stupidest things I've ever heard. Yeah. Right? Um, if you, if, if, if companies never agreed to exclusivity, we might not have an iPhone, <laughs> Because AT&T said, we need a five-year exclusivity in order to make this work. And Apple went for it. Um, exclusivity can be a great thing, but it's definitely a double-edged sword. And you have to be smart about it. You have to put in different protections. And there's plenty of ways to do that. But nevertheless, you know, it's not just about you know, negotiating and bargaining. It's not just about doing this, this tit-for-tat thing um, of, of putting a deal in place. But really, the written word, right? The written contracts and, and putting solid written agreements in place is at least as critical as, as that part, but sometimes it's overlooked. Um, let me stop there for a minute and uh, see if there's any thoughts, questions, comments. Anybody uh, agree or disagree? I have a question. Can you cover multiplier effect again? Um, you know, what comes to mind for me, and I just want to get more color from you, comes to mind for me is how I can leverage my resources, whether it's part of my sales team or part of my sales engineers. Can you Give me more of a bigger perspective on this. Yeah, absolutely. So as we're looking to grow our business, right, there's three different lanes that we can go. Organic, we're just going to build it ourselves. Number two, acquisition, we're going to get out the checkbook and we're going to buy it. Number three is to partner to do it. If in, in those cases where our partner can provide a resource at a lower cost or, you know, than, than what we can ourselves, that, that makes us exponentially better off on that piece than what we could internally. And so, you know, what are those different areas that we could give somebody a bigger bump than what they could do on their own? There's all of these small companies that are, you know, high tech companies that are partnering with these massive sumos. Why? Because these massive sumos are so clunky that they're not very good at innovation or they're just so risk averse or there's so much red tape in their company that they, they move so slow. So why are there so many, uh, these sumos that are partnering up with small companies? It's, it's because they can provide that multiplier effect. They can provide innovation at a fraction of the cost of what these Fortune 1000s are doing. 
Jeff, I think I may have heard something else in there that I picked up on. Um, so when you when you have when you're working with a much larger organization, what I think I heard also is you know if I'm under resourced on my side of the fence and able to support that, is there a way to you know leverage my internal resources, cross pollinate in different areas to maximize the resources I have to better support? some of those other maybe larger organizations you might be working with. That's a little different, uh, a little different context to, to what we're talking about here, but I, I thought I picked up on that in your question. I just wanted to dig in on that a little bit. Yeah, so I have a very large partner. They're a very large organization and um, we're obviously, they're, they're motive, their salespeople are motivated to sell their product first. So what resources can I provide, artifacts, people, et cetera, that help them do their job better, help them better uh, enable their, their salespeople? Obviously, I, I provide a lot of information already, but you know, just that's where my head goes when I think a multiplier is um, what, I, what I give them so they can do a better job selling. Yeah. I'll Go ahead, Mark. Look like you're getting ready to say something. I was going to say, you know, is there, I guess I would just want to uncover a little bit more of kind of what that specific relationship looks like and what you provide to them. But, you know, it, it really is. It's just about how let's constantly ask ourselves, how can we provide bigger, better, more faster for them? Make just make it more convenient. I mean, whatever the case is, what, what is it that your company can do that essentially your competitors, I guess, you know, one way to look at it, the, the same, the other folks that they're talking to that are similar to you, what is something that you can provide better than what they can? And if you are able to do that, then they would achieve a multiplier effect in doing that. Yeah, I, I'm going to add on to that, Mark. Um, you know, sometimes when we think of what can you do better and I, you know, and I'm going to look at this through the lens, kind of my area of specialty or expertise is around channel, uh, channel partnerships, different than technology or alliances or others. But when I'm working in the channel, a lot of times, you know, I'm dealing directly with sales organizations. And so how do I stay, you know, from my, my competitive nature and I think of the competitive landscape and, and a, a competitor to me, is anyone that's competing for that mind share with that partner. I want that partner always thinking about me. And so, as because I know everyone's knocking on their door, everyone's trying to get their attention. How do you not get diluted in that? And so I've got a number of strategies that's part of all of this that allow you to more effectively engage at multiple levels of that uh, sales organization so that you are staying top of mind. It's a, it's a, whole separate conversation and talk track, but it really comes down to some of the, what I call role-based partner pairings and different things you can do at a very tactical level. Uh, but there's, there's a lot to unpack there. That's a whole separate conversation probably, but uh, I thought I was maybe picking up on that a little bit where, uh, where you might uh, be looking, looking for some solutions. Yeah, I've got ideas. I'm not sure if I put that in a, in an agreement, but definitely how you work the relationship. Um, yeah relationship being number one, but how you work that relationship so you are top of mind and seen as additive to their organization's effort to sell your product rather than here you go, go get them, um, which doesn't work. Yep. You know, like, unless you have alignment, you know, the, the most perfect storm alignment. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Any other Thoughts or comments on this piece before we we step on? Let's 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 go back to the first level here. Doubling um, down on term sheet, like I've seen so many deal fail because people like give me the contract, give me the contract, and then you end up arguing for days on some weird legal term where you have not even agree on the commercial. So I'm I'm a big. I'm a hundred percent, if not two hundred percent, for term sheet first. Yeah, if if I can give a, a feedback from my experience, the term sheet are all the business issues. Yes. That way, the contract is just the the legal crap. Um, and I've seen when you try and accelerate it by throwing the, the agreement, it actually can can backfire, like you said. So 
I like to have it ironed out because it's going to take time and money to get and resources to review and redline all that crazy stuff. So I've always had that kind of concept of agree upon business terms first. Um, it hel helps, helps it go more smoothly. Yeah, Jeff, another thing is also if, if you have some quote unquote legal terms, if you have some legal terms that are non-standard, put those in the term sheet too, mm -hmm. because that, that's the whole idea with the term sheet is if we're going to let if we're going to argue let's argue early <laughs> let's mm -hmm. get everything on the table so that we're having this conversation so yeah to to the point that was made earlier we don't want to get months down the road to you know haggling and, and now we're getting you know law you know legal involved and all this stuff taking up all these other resources whenever we knew months ago that we never could agree to that yeah, so we definitely want to put all the business terms in there, but then also any non-standard legal terms. Let's go ahead and put those in the term sheet as well so that uh, so those are discussed. One more thing personally by experience is when the lawyers get involved and you haven't negotiated, they will start negotiating as if it's their deal and they will kill everything because lawyers get bored, especially general counsel, and they decided to get involved in business deals even though they have no idea what they're talking about and they'll scuttle it. So the MOI, as I call our term sheet, is a contract. It is a contract and you can operate under the MOI as long as you want. And then you can basically arm twist your general counsel for your side or their side. Like, look, this is the agreement. We agreed to it. That is the contract. And if you wanna make a better contract, you're gonna to adhere to these terms. You're not gonna make a new contract until it makes this work. Otherwise, this is the contract. And it would be the general counsel's fault, counsel's fault for failing to make a better contract, letting you operate under an email. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah, if you have to, to Sanir's point, if your lawyer is negotiating your business terms, you are screwed. And I love lawyers, but you're screwed. And we've all seen this. But yeah, you should have your business terms nailed down before lawyers get there. They, they try to be helpful, but uh, they, they, their job is to protect the business. And, and that's you know, the, the legal side of those agreements. Any other thoughts, questions, comments, insights? Awesome. Uh, next piece, we're getting down to the end. So it's better to have no deal than a bad deal. <laughs> and the next thing I'll say is um, the, the deal, getting a deal signed is not the finish line. That's the starting line, right? So even though it's challenging at times to get deals signed, that's really when the real work begins. That's when the baby's born. That's when the real work begins. Um, so we got to make sure that we put smart deals in place. So phase four, close the agreement. This is the go, no go. You know, so we've got to be honest with ourselves. Do we think that this is a good deal, good relationship? Is this going to work for the long term? Is it going to, to meet what we want it to meet for our organization? And conversely, you know, a, a deal that works for one party works for zero parties right? It has to work for both. And so, you know, will it work for our partners long-term? And literally we have that obligation. We got to make sure that, uh, that we make sure that it'll work for our partners long-term. Uh, whenever I did deals with Sprint, man, I can't tell you how many companies Sprint killed just because they allowed them to sign deals that, that the partners just either couldn't handle the volume or they just can't, couldn't handle the economics. And so we've got to make sure that we're doing smart deals. Number two, alignment. It goes, it's all about alignment, right? And just really digging into alignment up and down. Um, and then obviously the strategic fit. You know, we talked about the strategy that they're going to be on for years into the future. What's the strategy? What's the path we're going to be on years to the future? And if they don't intersect, if they're not complementary, then there's no way that, that that's going to be a fruitful relationship for the long term. Questions, thoughts, comments on uh, on this phase four. Awesome. All right, that's it. Uh, when we get to the end, you know, the, the finish line is not getting the deal signed. You know, the finish line comes years and years and years down the road whenever both parties are extracting the value from that. And so phase five is we've got to make sure that we operationalize that partnership and proactively manage it. And so, you know, as we all know, not all partnerships are created equal. You know, some partnerships can be, uh, you know, pretty transactional by nature, 
pretty easy to manage. Not a lot of moving parts. Either you know the, the partner and, and we are performing or we're not. And it's pretty simple to see that. Then we have the opposite end of the spectrum where we truly have some strategic partnerships, a lot of innovation, a lot of moving parts, you know, no, no recipe. We're kind of building the ship as we sail it, as we like to say. And so in those cases, it's, it's going to require a lot of proactive management. And so we need to have a framework that, uh, that we use for that. And that's what we covered last week, the strategic partner leadership model. That's one uh, operating system that we use for that. And then I'll just uh, kind of throw it here to the last slide and then hand it over to Mr. Evan. But um, this is the system. This is the system. Um, that we use. Yeah, so we got, we got a little bit of time. Jeff, I'm kind of curious. Um, did you want to give us a little more insight into kind of what you were thinking on that multiplier? I mean, we can use the time to basically kind of maybe, maybe kind of dig a little bit deeper into it. Or if anybody else has an issue that they're actually going through right now that we can, you know, actually you know, dig a little bit deeper into. Um, this is a great opportunity to kind of get some of Mark's time and, and get the group's input, so. Well, let me just oh, throw this little primer out there. Oh, go ahead, Jeff, sorry. The well, issue I brought up, that, that I was just clarifying because it was under contracts and so uh, no, no issue there. I, actually, in the big picture though, I am interested on the, the, the 12 components because um, that's the phase I'm in is alignment and, um, it's by piece by piece, but it's towards having an official doc. Manage expectations is a big one. Um, and also the, you know, the 90 day kind of approaches you talked about last time. So yeah. just in general, that, that those components, I mean, I, I know there, I have, I've outlined everything. There's a lot of components. I'd be curious what, what you identify in those 12 components. Yep, send me an email and I'll send you a, a copy of it. Okay, great, thank you. Um, another thing that I'll throw out there, and we kind of alluded to this earlier, but let's peel the onion a little bit more. You know, a lot of times whenever we're structuring deals, all of our companies, doesn't matter where we work at, even if it's Apple, we all have constraints. We all have certain constraints. But a lot of times whenever we're putting deals together, sometimes we just become so desensitized and we think that the constraints that we have at our company are the same constraints and the same level of constraints that other companies have. And that's not necessarily the case. So we need to kind of take those blinders off, take a fresh approach. You're never going to get something if you don't ask. But then also think about specifically, what are some value add pieces that this partner, this partner candidate, this impending partner that they may be able to provide to us that would provide a lot of value to us, but really come at no or little cost to them. And one obvious example of this is if you're a small company partnering with a sumo, getting a press release or getting something, you know, something as simple as a press release doesn't cost them anything. If you can, you know, get them to agree to do that, it can be massive, it can be a massive little bump, it costs them zero, about 10 minutes worth of time. And it can be, you know, really strong for your company. You know, there's, there's lots of different ways and different types of partnerships that our partners can provide just a little bit more value. Uh, it could be something as simple as information share. You know, maybe they've done some, some research, done some studies, sponsored some things. They have some insights, some know-how, or even some relationships to make some connections that we only know if we uncover, if we ask questions, we kind of we peel the onion with them a little bit. And uh, it's really important to, to spend the time to, to do that. Does anybody have any other uh, questions? I've got one if nobody's got one, but I'll give you guys a chance to, to jump in there. No, um, Mark, so I know there's, a, there's quite a few companies, myself included, one is a Proposify that are kind of around this multiplier effect um, that are using these partner channel programs and distribution models to get, you know, additional access to new markets, right? So instead of example would be, hey, you know, we've got a lot of uh, customers in Australia. Um, we're in North America. It's challenging to do business, you know, touch them for the full workday. We need to open up an office. Well, you know, it's, it's in the pipeline, not quite yet, maybe next year, but we've got this year that we need to look out to these customers. Let's do that through the partner model, right? And that's usually the first case is like, Let's land some sort of strategic partner down there. 
um, that can help us, uh, you know, onboard new uh, clients, maybe look after some existing ones, and then we'll kind of grow that relationship and then eventually maybe open up our own operations. Can you comment a little bit on that strategy? Because a lot, I see a lot of companies doing that um, and it's, it's not as easy as it sounds. Um, there's a, a lot of risks and obviously a lot of opportunity because you can multiply, multiply that in other markets. And actually, you know, you've got quite a big footprint very quickly. Um, but can you comment on like the, the dangers, opportunities just on, on that kind of strategy? Yeah, so it's our, our customers are really getting spoiled and that they're getting what they want. <laughs> you know, it's so funny. I, I can think back 15 years ago whenever I was um, sitting on an advisory board at a university. And the university, that's probably 18 years ago, and the university was trying to decide if they were going to allow their students to learn online, if they were going to offer up, you know, online courses. I was like, it's not your decision. If, if learners want to learn online, they're going to go learn online. It may not be at your university, but they're going to learn online. And so the, the interesting piece here is, um, you know, the, the, the world is becoming so much smaller, so globalized, and we have competitors everywhere, right, globally. And so the question is, what is the value that you provide relative to what your competitors provide? And so we are seeing this increase in almost like this, you know, this 24 by 7 cycle of whatever it is, right? So let's say um, customer support, customer care, or whatever the case may be, there's more and more companies that are jumping in and providing these different services like cloud task being one of those or Zendesk that either provides customer sales support, uh, customer care support, break fix, those sorts of things. Um, if you could do it at a, at a cost advantage, you know, absolutely. You know, that's, that's what business is about. That's what uh, the jobs to be done. Sunir and I were talking about this a few weeks back, you know, Clayton Christensen's model. It's, it's customers don't want products and, and, and services. They want solutions. They want big, easy buttons. And if you can make the easy button bigger for them, that's where they're going to go. It's the path of least resistance. Whoever's providing the most value for the dollar. Um, so can you do it? If you can do it good. Yeah, I mean, the challenge is like the reliance on a partner to do customer success, customer support, sales, like all the functions of a company. And I think a lot of companies usually uh, jump into it um, before they're ready, right? It's like, well, you, you maybe you figured it out for North America. It's not going to be the same in, in Australia or another country. So you're going to have to tweak it. And then also, you know, does that partner have the resources to do all of those things? Or is it just like, okay, we're just going to rely on that partner for customers. They're just going to look after existing customers and that's it. And then we'll start with that and go, go build it on. But more time and time again, you see they're going right for the biggest fish. Like we need someone that's going to do all of that. Um, I don't know. It just, to, to me, it's just, it's so risky to do that. Um, but yeah, I'm just kind of interested in what you think. Yeah. And there's definitely ways to crawl, walk, run. With, with any type of a solution, I think that we're jumping into new waters, you know, there's times to, we can, we can test it out and do those sorts of things. So one piece of it I would say is, so a, a partner, somebody that's offering a solution, you know, do they have the competency? Can they do it? That's kind of question number one, but honestly, it's part number two, our organization's ability to effectively manage and lead and work with that partner. That's a huge piece of the, of the equation that frankly is, is not always well managed. Uh, that's, that's what I love about this partnering role and this, this using and leveraging the power of partnerships because it is so vast, it, it is so complex. There are so many moving parts and companies that, that really dig in deep to understand it well, right? The art and science of partnering to really do it well they can have massive advantages over their counterparts. Mark, I'll color in a little bit on that too, just because I've, I've been involved with exactly what you're talking about, Evan, uh, on a number of time, or occasions on, you know, trying to penetrate new markets, new geographies, and doing that through a, through a partner, whether it be a, you know, a bar, which a bar or reseller is going to be more of a, an extension of your operational side where you have that, 
that presence and they're taking that level, you know, maybe level zero support and then the triage and all, all those sorts of things. But then you also have to look at it from the context, you know, is that partner, what's the primary business driver? Are they, are they a lead gen vehicle for you to, you know, from a customer acquisition uh, perspective? Uh, what, and you really have to start thinking, and I've had to deploy on many occasions kind of a certification process depending on the type of partnership it is. And it does go back a little bit to what Mark was talking about. And I think what Jeff talked about, and we talked about a little bit on just that role-based kind of pairing and, and having that collaboration and engagement at multiple levels with that partner. But I think also what's really important is before you go down that path, do you have sales enablement? Do you have training? Do you have support? Do you have all those things that are not just kind of gray areas, but do you have those bait? you have a, a certification process so that when you bring that partner on, you run them through an actual onboarding course and they prove and certify that they are, they can represent your brand in this market or this geography. If you don't have those things in place and it's just kind of a, just kind of a soft fluid type of engagement, uh, that's going to be a challenge. Um, yeah, I mean, I that's a lot more tactical. It's such a tough, and that's such a tough part too, is like how do you, you know what you need from a partner, um, you know, and it's not a fit for every product either because the price point has to reflect what their investment is into it. So it's this, you know, we're trying to quantify this like dance that we got to do when qualifying partners. It's like, well, here's what they do, their capacity, here's the price point of our product, here's the commission structure and the compensation and what's in it for them, right? And does that align with what our expectations are of this partner? Um, so you may have like 20, 30 partners coming through the door interested in, and more so not, like 90% of them are probably not qualified to be a partner, right? But a lot of companies are like, we just, we need to get this in, we need to get this out, we need to get this market, like, you know, so they compromise a lot of it, but, um, yeah, I mean, that's a topic of its own. So, but yeah, thanks for your insight, uh, Mark. Does anybody have any other uh, questions? We're gonna just a couple more minutes here. Um, so I'll just, uh, yeah, see if uh, anybody else wants to jump in. I have one and it goes back to maybe what we talked about last week around teams. And obviously partners kind of track with a lot of teams, but um, and quite often they're on their marketing, sometime on their sales. So uh, I think you approach that. Is there a better way? And of course, I guess it depends on the size of the company, but uh, some information there could be interesting. So is your, is your question around like a partner? Where the partner org should fit within a company. Yeah. So my recommendations, my thoughts are, Number one, partnering teams, especially if they are strategic in nature, if they're involved in some new innovation or some, some new capability that the company is trying to deliver, that person needs to, to, to tie into and to report to a senior executive that's also in a strategic long-term role. Here is what not to do. Here's what I've seen that, that causes some, some issues is if you have a partnering team that truly is strategic, kind of taking this long-term approach, let's say they're standing up a, a new partnering program, whatever the case is, a lot of times it's gonna take at least 12 to 18 months for those programs to, to get legs underneath them and to be kicking off a good amount of, of revenue. What, what doesn't work is having that person or having that team report into a very transactional role like a sales role because sales is that day-to-day -day grind. And whenever people are looking for resources because we're behind quota, <laughs> what do they get pulled from? They're no longer working on that initiative that's a year off. They're working on the shit that's a week away. And so that rarely works well. Um, but you know, it's the, the, the main thing is that number one, they have a solid strategy that they're executing against. Number two, they have executive support. They're aligned with where the, the company is going. Number three, also the culture. The partnering culture is a different culture than a, a, a typical, I guess I'll call it like kind of a sales oriented or kind of the standard culture. 
right? If you have a, a company that doesn't have a partnering function and now you infuse a partnering function, it changes the culture or it requires a shift of the culture and they need to be supported. They need to be understood. It's amazing how many times that partnering teams can almost be at combat with some of the other resources internally from sales, from marketing um, in other places, right? A lot of times partnering, the partnership groups or those initiatives, they can touch all of these different lanes. Everything for engineer, product development, operations, they could be taking some of their resources from them. So it could really be challenging. And plus on in the market or the in that partnering role, most of the time people don't report to us unless they're on yeah. a partnering team. But we need to be able to influence and we need to be able to work cross functionally. But if that marketing person or the, the sales lead or whoever the case is, that IT person that we might need some help from or getting data from to do our jobs effectively, if, if they don't embrace this, this culture of, of having the partnering team be a part of our success, won't work. If I can just uh, emphasize that, I was in the organization where it was put under sales and everything I needed was deprioritized when it was the end of the month, right? Um, I think if it's purely a, a channel by reaching new markets, it may make sense to be under marketing as an area. Um, if your partnership is bringing in uh, to partner on solutioning, maybe it goes within more your solutioning area. Um, for me, I, I've been brought on board to head up partnerships and I report to the CEO, which is like for the situation of a build, I couldn't ask for a better way to go because they can point and have authority um, on who helps and what resources. But I have had bad experiences when it reports to sales. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, uh, that's a great segue into a, a wrap up here. We're, we're at time. So um, thanks everybody for, for joining, uh, joining us here. Thank you, Mark, for, for a great session. Um, let's, let's take it into Slack. If you guys have any questions or, or follow up uh, topics and themes that you'd like to see, just post them in, uh, in Slack and we'll, uh, we'll get it going. So anyway, thanks everybody for joining me and have a great holiday. For more great insights on partnerships and software, like and subscribe, and we'll see you in the next video.